sense. So we kind of went down that path. So, so yeah, the last time we did this, we used streaming analytics and machine learning. So my background is as a data scientist doing machine learning, uh, genetic algorithms, heuristic search algorithms. So we actually built uh, a working prototype. This is the microphone too. Uh, so we actually built a working prototype, but it had some issues with it, right? And it wasn't sensitive enough to detect stuff. There were too many false positives, um, you know, kind of classic analytics problems. A lot of the algorithms were proprietary software algorithms, so when it came time to basically put it in production, um, that project, actually one of its big issues, was one of the software vendors, uh, who actually is my former employer, uh, who I quit after they screwed the project because they wouldn't give a software license. We so, rapidly uh, hired him immediately after that. Yeah. So, um, and the other thing was at the end of the day, you still needed someone who was pretty sophisticated to operate this stuff, right? If you're doing analytics or statistics, you need to understand math and statistics. If you're doing network engineering, you need to understand network engineering. So the question was, you know, what could we do to make this more open and get more people working on the problem without them necessarily having to have really deep, really specific knowledge of, you know, network engineering, mathematics, statistics. So, um, you know, the idea with our approach was, can we actually take raw data and do for raw data what the GUI did for the personal computer, right? So once we created this metaphor of the desktop and pictures and files, you know, people who didn't know how to write code could actually buy and use a computer. And so the question was, could we do the same thing for data, right? Could we take, in this case, network data, which is streaming data, right? Could we analyze it and visualize it in a way that would make it representative to someone who may have no technical background at all, right, but can look at patterns. So the idea was kind of a prosthetic for the brain. And it also had to be real time. Yeah. So, but before we worry about hooking up to the brain, you don't have to flip out. Um, <laughs> so this is, of course, not what we did, but we put some cool videos in here because we could. <laughs> so we came up with the idea of data looming, right? So the idea is you can go look at a loom and I can set a loom up and have the threads come in and make a very complex pattern like this Persian carpet. If you watch that loom working, you're going to have a hard time figuring out how every thread works, right, by trying to deconstruct the loom. On the other hand, the thing that comes out the other side is very obvious to you, right? Like this is a floral pattern in a Persian carpet. So could we take these very complex data patterns and put them into a virtual environment to make them more obvious to the user? So how John came up with this data looming concept was I had Wireshark up one day and I'm watching all the stuff flow through Wireshark. And he goes, what the hell is that shit? I said, I'm watching what's going on in the network. He goes, head's obscene. How are you going to figure anything out? I'm like, you just got to watch really carefully. So he, he made the analogy of, well, it kind of looks like it, it would be you're building a fabric on a loom with, and we came up with this whole concept of data looming. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so part of the reason we're also doing this is that, you know, we got started working, uh, trying to detect zero-day attacks, right? So zero-day intrusions. Um, you know, part of the problem is you have a sparse pattern recognition problem, right? So, you know, sparse pattern recognition is an area of machine learning and statistics where I'm trying to draw inference from very limited data. So the purpose of this slide is to, to make a point about what people do versus what computers do. So I can take a three-year-old kid and show them an eagle and tell them it's a bird. I can show them a swan and tell them it's a bird. And then if I show them a cardinal, the kid knows it's a bird, right? You know, the most sophisticated pattern recognition algorithms out there still cannot do this, right? Because they require data curation, they require definitions, they require training sets. Uh, CAPTCHAs are another example of, of, of a way that we can show that human beings can understand these images and computers still can't. Um, the other example are the yellow lines on the school bus. So there were some researchers who actually built a series of random image generators that were able to fool uh, image recognition algorithms. So this again is all about the fact that the best pattern recognition algorithm we still have is the human brain, right? So how do we find ways to make raw data more accessible to the brain? And this is kind of the slide about where we came from. So uh, John handed me a book, I guess about two years ago. And um, it was called Neuromancer. 
And I was like, oh man, this is the Matrix. And he's like, yeah, this is the Matrix. He's like, let's build it. I was like, okay, we're going to build the Matrix. And we got all excited and we started thinking about all the other things that were going to go into it. Um, talking about how we wanted to do it, how we wanted to approach it, what we needed to do. Uh, we realized we're both sucky game developers, so we apologize for the visualization we're going to show you later. Um, we decided to do it all in open source because closed source sucks, and that's the, the genesis of John and I teaming up. Um, we needed some network expertise. We needed some data science expertise, and we wanted to make it so that we could almost gamify network defense. So you're playing, you know, Candy Crush, and you have no idea that you're actually defending my network for me. Um, so that was kind of the lead in to the whole concept of getting to the big idea. So the idea was to, again, focus on what a computer's good at, right? So high speed, high precision, high recall, not quite as good at sparse pattern recognition. Interface that with the human brain, which is very, very good at sparse pattern recognition, but has a very low baud rate and sucks at precision and recall, right? Anybody who's ever forgotten a birthday or an anniversary knows how bad we are at recall. Um, and in order to kind of get that last mile to the human being, create an immersive interface so that the way that you interact with the data actually feels a lot like, it doesn't feel like you're doing data analytics or network engineering. As Rob said, you're playing a game. So um, just kind of, we broke it down to four major areas that we needed to kind of tackle. Um, one was data. We had a huge data problem. We couldn't find anyone to allow us to censor a network. I don't know why. Uh, we couldn't allow anybody to give us data from anything. Don't know why. Uh, even going out to uh, uh, academia and saying, hey, can we censor your network for like a week? They're like, no. Um, so we came up with uh, some training sets that we had. Uh, we built up a, a red team, blue team, captured a flag platform that we were able to um, capture some data from teams playing against each other, and that's kind of what we used as a basis for the um, the, the scoring data. Uh, the training data was all just kind of synthetic and boring. Uh, the platform, we really wanted to make this as, as, as fast as possible, because um, in network defense for zero-day detection, it really is one of those things that you got to be kind of on the money at operating at wireline speed. Um, and then heterogeneous networks really screws all with that up. And, and so just trying to figure out how to get it as fast as possible, as scalable as possible. Um, we quickly learned that if we were going to do a user experience that was immersive, that we had to come up with some type of visual language construct. So I have to be able to describe the data enough such that I can create objects from that data that has metadata attached to it that I can put into a virtual environment. Um, that actually... Uh, it was a really foreign idea to a lot of the major game manufacturers that we talked to. Um, they didn't understand non-scenario based um, gameplay. They're like, what do you want to do with it? Why? You know, how, how's that scenario work? How's a person win this game? And we're like, they don't, they just play. Um, they just didn't get that. So uh, we also wanted to do a 3D experience that was immersive that also acted like real world physics so that anybody could play it. So if you're used to climbing up staircases, you know what that feels like, going down staircases. Throw things up, they fall. They shoot things, they blow up. So that's kind of how we wanted to model those four areas. Of course, the important thing here is if you're going to connect this to a brain, it needs to be a good brain, not an abnormal brain. <laughs> um, so this is the architecture. Um, first gen, the first uh, version that we built uh, a year and a half ago. So about a year and a half ago, we actually put the thing together and made it work. Um, the majority of this, well, all of this is actually open source. Um, a lot of stuff that you guys see up here is probably really familiar to you if you're into big data analytics or streaming analytics. Uh, nothing new, nothing neat, unique, nothing novel. Just a hell of a lot of research and trying to figure out how the architecture would all fit together and work. Um, the most important thing that we built was the, the visual language construct. So that was kind of something that didn't exist before, and that was kind of the bridge between the streaming analytics world um, and the actual user experience. Uh, if you guys remember, in the Matrix, Neo goes into the white room, says, I need guns, and the guns come out. Well, that's kind of where we put the capability for us to describe things to bring into the game. And actually, a couple thoughts. So the, the user experience is based on the Blender game engine, open source game engine, probably not the ideal game engine, but it's open source. 
Um, the analytics, which are kind of my, my thing, right? I'll talk about that for one second. Um, I'm sure most people in this room know Storm is basically the infrastructure that Twitter runs on top of, right? So it's a very, very scalable open source environment for uh, streaming data and doing analytics. The challenge with Storm is that Storm is a stateless computing environment. So it puts the data someplace and then it forgets about it. So the minute you need to do analytics, any kind of mathematics, statistics, classification, it doesn't work. Well, Nathan Mars, who created Storm, is a pretty smart guy. So there's a framework inside Storm called Trident that's a stateful framework inside the stateless environment. And then there's a library called Trident ML, which is basically a set of um, uh, bolts for Storm. So operations in Storm are called bolts. It's a set of bolts that actually enable you to put analytics in Storm Trident. So there's already some bolts there. We use some off-the-shelf stuff. But basically, any kind of Python or Java analytic can sit inside of the Trident ML framework, which is actually really, really cool because there is a limitless supply of open source Python and Java analytics out there, right? So you could actually build this and deploy dozens, if not hundreds, of analytics on your streaming data without really having to write any analytics, which is part of the benefit. I'm of the view as a data scientist that we don't actually need to write any more analytics. Um, there is a almost limitless supply of open source analytics out there. We just need to focus on using them better. So. <clears throat> so again, going back over to design principles, you know, we wanted to use all open source components, not burden our customers or friends or family with uh, dealing with licensing. Um, we wanted to make sure that, that we were able to, to run the data through and score it and validate it very, very quickly. Um, one of the things that uh, our customer base likes recently is immersive user experiences. They call it, oh, immersive UX, immersive UX, got to have it. So that's, that's kind of where we um, were also trying to address the recruiting problem. So if we wanted to have really cool kids, you know, in the basement on Friday night um, playing our game, it needed to be some kind of interesting factor behind it. And then also the pluggable architecture. You know, we're not, we're not the smartest guys in the world. We're, you know, we're okay. But bottom line is there's a lot smarter people out there. So we wanted to develop a pluggable architecture, let them bring their own things into this. So you can bring in your own... Tools. You can design a tool and plug it into the, into the uh, visual language construct and bring it into the game with you. If you want to develop a botnet to come in and help you analyze data, you can do that. If you want to build your own analytics, you can do that. So that's kind of how we wanted to make it extensible. So this is kind of my favorite slide. Um, Larry Bird, Network Defender of the Future. So coming back to this idea of sparse pattern recognition and what the human brain is good at versus what computers are good at. You know, most pro athletes, what they're really good at is pattern recognition, right? I mean, a pro athlete is good because, you know, Wayne Gretzky skates to where the puck is going to be in two seconds, right? Michael Jordan goes to where the ball is going to be on the court in five seconds. And they're really, really, really good at that, even if they don't know how to write code or they don't understand how a network topology works. And so my favorite part of this slide is all these, these plays, right? <laughs> But half of these diagrams are basketball plays, and half of them are diagrams of network intrusions. And so when you actually look at the diagrams, what you realize, they're pretty similar. So if I could actually create a construct that lets people look at data intuitively, right, I can use my, my network engineers, my certified security professionals, basically as leaders, and I can hire high school basketball players to do pattern recognition. There are a lot more high school basketball players than there are certified security professionals. So, another one's talking. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, we know we're on the defense and we know we're outnumbered big time, so uh, we're trying to look at, you know, ways to incentivize people to, to, to think about different ways of doing network defense. Um, you know, there's all, the whole points aspect. People love points. Um, there's monetary aspects, and John and I talked about maybe having you know, soldiers of fortune for network defense and paying them like, you know, a couple hundred grand a year to come in and just do nothing but network defense for us by playing a game. Anybody up for that job? Yeah. All right. Yes. Resumes or email Sweet. later. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we also wanted to do for data what GUI, GUIs did for the standard OS, you know, make it understandable. And, and you, any guys deal with like, like large data, seeing graphs of large data links and nodes analysis and see like the big fur balls? Like Multigo. Like Multigo. Oh. 
like Montego. Um, so you realize that problem is that, you know, I get a big furball in front of me. I really don't understand how to interact with it or deal with it or what the hell is this thing telling me. Um, and then, you know, we realize it's not really about the technology. It's more about, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to interact with this stuff that's already there in a way that makes us, you know, jump a couple generations forward or start thinking about how to jump that forward. So, of course, innovation can <laughs> often take strange forms. That, that actually is uh, Mr. Porsche. Is early R&D, which is kind of what our demo is, too. So with that, okay, we'll talk about our demo. All right. Uh, what you got, John? Yeah, so, so basically, you know, as, as Rob mentioned, we did a simulation. We did some CTF data in the botnet. Very simple demo, um, focused on network data. What you're actually going to see, so inside of the Trident Storm framework, we're using an analytic called k-means clustering. And, and what clustering does is it identifies local populations. So if we took this room and made it totally dark and filled it with children, basketball players, and regular adults, right? You would basically have three populations, children, basketball players, and regular adults. And if all I knew was height, right, and I was just doing averages or trends, I wouldn't be able to figure that out. So what a k-means does is identify sort of local, uh, what are called local minima or centroids. So you'd say, okay, well, I got a population that has an average height of three foot four. I have a population with an average height of six foot eight, and I have a population with an average height of five foot eight, right, which are people like Rob and I. Um, so the idea is we simply ran k-means clustering on port pairing. So in essence, we have three centroids that come out of our clustering algorithm. The first one, which are the green nodes, right, um, are basically uh, devices or nodes in the network where the source centroid is a relatively high point. So it's sending and receiving on a high port to a low port so it looks like a client. Um, by the way, this is stuff I've learned from Rob. Yeah, so John, I'm letting John, you know, I'm, I'm taking the training wheels off and John's going to explain to you guys source and destination ports. Right. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the blue, the blue nodes, right, are nodes that are sending and receiving on a low port to a high port. So it basically looks like a server. And then the yellow nodes are what we call indeterminate, right? So they're using these kind of ports in the middle. There's no real pattern. Um, so basically, they're not consistently behaving one way or another. And, and this also gets into when we first started working together, you know, as a guy who's base, whose background is basically in statistics and math, my first thing is, well, where's your training set and where are your outcomes? And Rob's like, dude, we don't have any outcomes. <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't have any outcomes? Like, dude, we can't go audit every single session on the network to figure out if it's legitimate or malicious. Right? I said, oh, that's a bit of a challenging problem because most statistics are designed to train to an outcome. So part of our approach was to identify things and put them into buckets so the human operator can look and say, oh, here's a pattern that looks like a normal pattern or an abnormal pattern or a suspicious pattern or something that's just different. Right? And so this is why also we don't use the words good and bad right? because good and bad don't mean anything in this context. It's more about what looks different. So when we're going to run our demo, <laughs> so um, the demo that you're going to see is really basic. It's blocks and spheres, and um, they have different colors that represent the, the different centroids, right, John? Centroids? Yes, centroids. So see, math stuff, I don't know that either. Um, so the idea it is... It sounds to, like robots, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're looking at is we're looking at how things are changing over time in a real-time scenario based on the traffic that we're pumping through the system okay, and scoring uh, real-time. Uh, the demonstration we're doing today is a video. It's, it's canned and recorded so that we can talk to it because uh, unfortunately every time we run a simulation it, it changes on us in a good way. Um, but uh, so you'll see some things that are consistent in a normal network. You'll see some white nodes which are nodes that really we haven't had any information about yet right, at all. Right, there's not enough data. Not enough data to talk about. Um, there are some blue nodes which represent the client nodes on the network. Servers. And there are some green nodes, um, which are the clients. clients. Yeah. Okay, so we got that backwards. We got yeah. Oh, did I write that? And then backwards? what we're looking at is what happens over time, right? So we're looking for the different behaviors. So the, that's the interesting aspect of it. How are, are these things sending data to and from? What are the patterns? What are the roles? Are the roles of these things changing? If so, what can we infer from looking at the data being transmitted? Um, and then. Uh, Demo. There we go. We'll do the demo. All right. So I'm gonna start the recording here. Are you gonna do the, the time runs? Yeah. Okay. So initially, uh, what you'll see here is we're starting up the Blender game engine, starting up the uh, streaming data, 
which is our sensors, that pumps it through the analytics platform into the construct, into the game. And then you'll see, uh, you'll see the game visualization come up here. And you'll see that the blocks that are appearing on the screen are the nodes in the network. And I don't know if you can see it really well, but you have packets of data transmit, transiting between the nodes. Um, this is really bad lighting for this, John. We should have made this bigger. But you want to stop it for a sec? Yeah. Maybe. A little better. A little better. Okay. So maybe if you can't see it, there you go. That's, that's better. There we go. Okay. So now what you see is you see the data packets coming across the screen there going from source uh, node to destination node. Um, the different colors, again, are, are telling us the, the behaviors of the nodes on the network. Um, the colors of the balls kind of simulate um, what we determine as being either uh, server traffic, client traffic, or undetermined traffic. Um, over time, where are we at in the time? Yep, so we're at 45 seconds. So actually in the bottom left, you can see okay. this so node we have, here. We have a node here that's kind of acting kind of wacky, and all of a sudden you'll see him go ahead and do a port scan. So this one here, watch him go ahead and change so he's color. Fli he's flipping colors between uh, uh, green and blue. So and client to server, back to client. So it's kind of one of those interesting nodes on the network that if you look at this over time and you wonder what this thing's doing, and all of a sudden he'll just kind of fire up and start spewing data all the different directions and everything else. Um, we kind of have a rudimentary heads-up display where it says nothing to see here right now, but the reticle, as we kind of fly in and zoom in, eventually we'll tell you what the IP address is on that node. Uh, this is a, an internal network node. It's known. It's supposed client. to be a client. Um, he starts acting kind of wacky here and starts spewing packets to many, many, many different machines, and you see he starts getting in responses. So we're pulling out again. Yeah, so you can see, I'm going to see the overall architecture in the network that we have mapped. And this, this network has been censored so that we can get um, information about external and internal um, IP addresses. And so this is an internal uh, nope. server? That's outside. Oh, I'm sorry, external server, yep. I so, have very bad handwriting. <laughs> so uh, John and I this morning went through and made a whole bunch of notes about the video because usually we have a voiceover, but the voiceover is, is kind of aimed at a different audience. And you have us here in person. And we're here in person. Um, so as this is going, you can see that this node is kind of acting normally yep. as a server. So it's kind of nothing. Maybe we'll pull back out again. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do is have interactability with this so you can fly through the entire scene and play around and get metadata about the nodes. The heads-up so, display in the future, we, we plan to go ahead and add a lot more information about that. Yep. Um, uh, so I, I paused it because now what we were going to do is the node in the bottom left-hand corner that was flip-flopping its behavior, right, and then did a port scan, now start sending a lot of traffic and communicating with an external or a, an undetermined node in the upper right-hand corner. So we saw a lot of traffic coming out from that little greenie, and he's going and blasting this yellow guy, and we don't know why. Yeah. So it turns out that, that that actually is another internal uh, IP address that actually should be a server. But isn't but, behaving. But he keeps flip-flopping back between client server, client server. Yeah. And then at 2 minutes and 25 seconds, we'll find another node that's changing behavior, but that's actually our router. So you expect a little bit of kind of flip-flopping behavior from your router. So we, we also envision not just bringing network data in to, to, to just kind of represent on the screen, but also any other type of uh, metadata enrichment data that we can think of to bring into the analytics to kind of help us understand better what the overall picture is. Um, and then as the analysts go through and understand what's happening or the game players go through and, and tell you what's happening, um, you can add those in as analytics back into the pluggable architecture to make your, your stuff a lot smarter over time. So it's all about, you know, how much smarter can I make this platform over periods of time? What was this one again? Same guy again? Yeah. All right. So at this point, there's not much more to show that's different because this is the limit yeah. of the simulation. So it's blocks and, and circles, and they kind of talk, and, you know, it's very simple uh, analytics that are in this right now. Um, we're looking at generation two. Yep. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll get a little bit of time and funding for for the development of the next generation. 
Uh, we're in talks right now with a couple of game, manu game manufacturers about building a sort of real user experience. Question? Yeah, so we did a demo for ShmooCon two years, two years ago. Two years ago, and uh, we had the Nerf gun, and we were shooting the little robots, and that was that would kill the packets and kill the nodes. Yeah. Uh, we realized that that didn't scale really well and kind of locked up. Um, so what we did was we dumbed it down, but the concept's still the same: is right. the user would be allowed to take certain actions inside the game environment. And those actions would then uh, uh, could trigger active countermeasures or right. Uh, other types of uh, uh, network defense activity. So one of the things we want to do, so part of the, the design of the construct, as Rob said, is the ability to bring tools and analytics into the environment. So for those of you who've worked with streaming data or the storm environment, um, basically data streams are, are rendered as tuples. So one of the things we talked about is actually adding attribution into the tuple so that once you have that, if I have a, an active countermeasure and the gamer um, shoots the packet, throws a bomb at the node, e.g. take the node offline, right? It would actually send a signal back to the OSS software to take something down. Question? That's a good question. So that's, that's a great question, and that comes down to... Uh, baselining. Baselining, and it also comes down to what do you think? Right. So you're the analyst, you're looking at that and you say, hey look, there's a lot of you know, traffic going from this node to that node right. and it's high volume and it's kind of flipping behaviors. Um, you could do deep packet analysis at that point. We, the individual packets actually have metadata attached to them. So you could write an analytic that says, you know, if this is this type of protocol going from this source to this destination, it kind of makes sense. So go ahead and not flag it, not, you know, just ignore it. You can do, yeah, this, yeah, this, that's this, another this platform is wide open, man. You can do whatever you would like. Because if your machines are talking to one of them, well, yeah, yeah, that's got a red flag over it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. There's actually question in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's <clears throat> my... Uh, about a week ago, I changed jobs, and so one of my last things that I was working on right before I left was uh, organizing the networks into quadrants. Uh, right now, they're all kind of around where Blender considers zero, zero in the middle of the screen, and they just spawn wherever they spawn, right. but looking at the subnet and giving them their own geographic area to spawn in was kind of the next thing I was going to do so that you could look at the difference between your subnets and external resources and, and understand yeah. traffic patterns a little bit better. One of the final design principles, who, who in this room has actually read Neuromancer? Right? So, so one of the design principles is to actually eventually get this to look like um, the, the matrix in Neuromancer, right? So the idea is you would actually build your topologies into your geography in the game so people can actually see where things are and where they're located and clustered. And so, so yeah, so this yeah. actually this this data source this data source is being uh, collected by NetFlow V5 sensors, uh, soft OD, <clears throat> and what it does is it collects the data, spools it into a centralized collector that we do a uh, slowly transformation before we dump it into the analytics platform. We enrich right. it with location data. Um, but we basically parse it, right? Parse, we parse it, it into things that are machine yeah, readable. Yeah, make it. For our purposes right now, we have a very small subset of information that we're interested in. Uh, currently, it's NetFlow v5, but you can bring Nmap information into this. You could bring um, geo information into this. You could bring any kind of information that you want. As long as you can correlate the data to the, to the nodes, you're fine. Yeah, so that's, that's a great point. So um, one of the things that, that the, uh, the game designers asked us was, how does somebody win this thing? And we're like, you don't. 
But so you can, the idea behind scoring the points is if if there's a you know you could do a consensus base like everybody decides that this is a bad thing and you award points for that. Well, and or, in, I'm sorry. In, in the Schmookon demo we did, we had a scoring system where basically we looked at the number of packets dropped over time relative to disruption of uh, network operations. So it's not a super hard thing to do, but yeah, you have to account for stuff like that. Ooh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so if you let a bunch of bad packets go by you while you were watching, you lost points, and if you, you identified the bad packets going by... you the whole network, you lose points. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you nuked the whole network, then it kind of defeated the purpose. We got it. Yeah, so we that's talked about that. that. That's attribution. So um, one of the things that we wanted, we were talking about doing was actually putting in, you know, trust relationships and issuing people. Uh, the general population game players would not have the ability to take the action. They would just score points, and we would learn from them from their experiences. Yeah. But the guys that actually could take the action would be it's like a private cert that we would understand that we can go ahead and take that action in, a, in an authenticated way. Right, and the idea we had from a gaming perspective was to kind of use the same model eBay uses, right? So if you really want to do this right, you make the game very, very open, so you can actually see the other players as well. So if the bulk of the players are actually compensated for keeping the network safe and you have a malicious person in the game, they could attack the malicious person and take them down. And that's actually the most effective way to deal with it, because instead of having some you know, some god up here who has to make decisions. He basically look, if 90% of the people know that this person is doing something bad, yeah. just take them off. So the guy that's like, you know, I'm just going to shoot the router. I'm just going to shoot the router. I know we've got a question over here. Are you exploring down the time scale of the kind of pay reduction? Yes. Yeah, so um, two, two of the problems that, that, that we talked about were, was um, what does the granularity of the visualization need to be? Right. Um, some of our folks that we talked to said, you know, it would be really great if you could do uh, different types of layers and, cl and clustering so that you could see very high level information and drill down into the, into the depths of it. Um, and that's kind of what the, the approach that we're taking. Right now, this is NetFlow v5 data, so it's kind of yeah, aggregated at the conversation level. Um, and this is, you know, we haven't done a whole lot of metrics on actually uh, how how much time elapses between the, the information entering in the front end of the analytics to the back end of the game. Um, there's some experimentation we need to do. So uh, we do know how it scales, though, so we can, we can yeah. figure out how to scale it horizontally and vertically. And, and talking about the scaling and the resolution challenges, right? So this is something that's kind of cool about Storm. So one of the things we've talked about, the, the scaling challenge is really, since Storm scales horizontally, it's basically an optimization problem, right? So how do you optimize your storm environment and have enough nodes and clusters ready to go to scale up and down with traffic? But the other thing is the resolution problem. And what we talked about was actually having multiple storm topologies running in parallel at different levels of aggregation, right? So in, in, in reality, you couldn't really zoom in and out on this data effectively because the amount of compute power you'd require would be huge, right? But if we actually had like a low res topology running and a medium res and a high res, when you're actually zooming, you're not really zooming, you're actually swapping to visualizing a different resolution stream. Um, and that's basically just an engineering and a resource problem. Um, I don't want to trivialize it because it's not trivial. And I think there's a question in the back. Yeah, so that gets into the behavior analysis of the endpoints and the people using them. And that is another thing that we were looking at as far as collecting data to add into the metadata uh, enrichment process eventually. And yeah, so one of the things we have on our roadmap is to add in things like Nmap data and, and other sorts of information. Yeah. So, just, I mean, block, just looking at a block and saying, you know, letting the analytics say whether or not it's client or server doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you know that information ahead of time. So that, that's kind of where the data enrichment comes into play. Sir. Yeah, so that, that also comes into, you know, knowledge that you have ahead of time about your network that you'd have to, you'd have to put into the analytics platform to understand that. Yeah, because if you can model that and train that ahead of time, like say my updates go on, you know, 
WSUS, midnight to 4 a.m. every, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. You can model that pattern and then anything outside that window that got scored by that as, as matching would be identified as malicious. And, and actually from the analytics perspective, there are the training blocks. So you could actually set the analytics to train off of a known normal set yeah. and then turn the training off and then run real data through it. And it would tell you when stuff comes out of tolerance. Now again, this is all you know, John Robb's proof of concept. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Simply add engineers. <laughs> so, <laughs> besides us. Very limited real data. Any other questions? Questions? Yeah. How do we play with it? How do you play with it? Okay. So, unfortunately, Blender does not allow us to have a web based interface. So, um, you can go out to my GitHub and pull it all down and play with it. Um, or you can email us. Or you can email us. Uh, and take a look at um, the different you know, free and open source people that, that kind of have provided us all the building blocks. Um, realistically, um, the, the majority of the work that John and I did were, was assembling the platform, right. the software stack, implementing really simple analytics in the middle, and then building the hooks into Blender. The reason why we chose Blender was because it was Python, and you know, I'm a badass Python developer. And so I was able to really quickly build in my hooks to stream data into a game engine, which most people don't really do. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, CarolinaCon.